Firstly, thank you to the organisers. Sandwiches make such a difference. <laughs> I follow to these meetings three, four, five nights a week, and it's a hunt for a chippy. <laughs> I ought to be about 20 stone by now. If it wasn't for all that stress, I'll tell you, I'd be in trouble. And lovely to be in Walkerburn. Um, many fond memories of Walkerburn. I'm from Bigger, so we used to come over here playing rugby quite often. Um, and in fact, my first win as a non-school boy. First ever game that we won as a non-school school boy was in Walkerburn. Um, so lots of pleasant memories, but they do get a bit vague towards the end. So lovely to be here and probably make it home and remember what happened. Is this as good as it gets? That's what I really want to ask. Is this as good as it gets? And if it's not, how can it be better? Can we do it? Have we got what it takes? Have we the ability to be better? That's all I want to talk about tonight. Because one of the things in this campaign which has come up over and over again is this idea that it's all about hope versus fear. That we're offering hope and that they're just trying to scare people out of it with fear. Actually, it's almost worse than that. It's not about hope and fear. It's about confidence and not confidence. Because confident people can do amazing things. When people are confident, when people believe that they are capable of doing things, they can do amazing things. And when people's confidence is down, when it's low, when people don't believe in themselves, they crawl into a corner and let things be done to them. It's about confidence. Can we be confident in Scotland? Well, I think what we can be confident with is Westminster rule. Let's just, uh, let's just have a quick look at where we actually are. If you are working, you are working in the second lowest paid economy in the developed world. If you are, you have the um, third lowest, third longest hours in Europe and the lowest number of holidays in Europe. If you are a pensioner, you have the lowest state pension in Europe and you're the third most likely of 28 European countries, you're the third most likely to live in poverty. If you're a woman, you are the eighth, but you have the, you're living in the country with the eighth biggest gap between male and female earnings and you're living in the country with the highest childcare costs in Europe. If you are disabled, you have the lowest level of benefits in Europe. And you have the highest likelihood of every country in Europe, the highest likelihood of living in poverty. You stop and think about that for a second. If you're disabled, you'd be better to be in Bulgaria. You'd be better to be in Lithuania. These are better places to be disabled than Britain. If you're a worker, you live in a country with the 27th worst track record of industrial democracy, of giving workers a say in their work. Only Lithuania is worse. We have the third highest high housing costs. We have the highest rail costs. We have a productivity record in industry, which is 16 percentage points behind the average of an advanced economy. Of all the um, developed economies in the world, of which there's over 40, only two have seen a reduction in industrial output. That's making, building, creating, doing, exporting and selling things. Only two have seen a reduction in that in the last 35 years. One is France that fell by about 4%, the other is Britain that fell by 35%. Every single other developed economy has seen an increase in their industrial production and those range from about 18% to 100% increase. So if anyone tells you that you can't manufacture, you can't make things in a developed, an advanced economy, developed economy, well, everyone else can, it's just us that can. This is the reality of where we are. We are in the fourth most unequal country in the developed world. This is not an accident. This is all a result of one model of politics. It's a model of politics which we call Me First Politics. It was a philosophy that Westminster introduced when Thatcher arrived and it assumes that if you can create a war of all against all, if everybody fights each other and then we just wait around, find out who won and give them everything, if we do that, eventually, through some crazy process of Darwinian selection, we will have the best possible society. Of course, it's madness. Because if you create a war of all against all, first of all, most people lose. That's the reality. That's why we have this problem. And second of all, those that win, once they start winning, you can't stop them anymore. That's what's happened in our economy. So if you think about what's happened in our economy, we have said, whoever is the biggest and most um, able to defeat the other businesses in their sector, we just keep backing them. And we keep backing them and backing them and backing them and eventually we'll reach utopia. All that means is if you live in a town like this and somebody decides they want to turn up, buy a field, put a shed in it, buy cheap stuff from China, sell it to you expensively and close down your high school, close down your local economy, that's supposed to be good for you. 
If it means that someone has bought all the available land for housing, and they use the ownership of all of that land to push housing prices higher and higher, the cost of that um, comes out of your pocket. Because in the end, it's people who are trying to get in the housing ladder who want to move. They're not paying it. Property developers make the money. Seven out of the ten richest people in Britain are property developers. Skill-free job. Buy a house, sell it. Buy two, sell them. Buy five, sell them. And wait. That's all the property development is. We know how the banks have behaved. The ba banks have made their money by closing down. I find, this, I find this amazing. I can't believe there's nobody in jail. Banks were caught deliberately bankrupting small and medium-sized businesses who were their customers so that they could take the assets from those businesses at a knockdown price and sell them on. They were caught doing that. That's the nature of our banking sector. It made its money from us. Advertising, marketing, again and again, the outsourcing of public services, again and again, corporations have been operating in what we can only really call a cartel model. So you can choose between one of four supermarkets, one of four telecoms providers, one of six volume house builders, um, banks, one of four or five major banks. Again and again, whatever sector you get into, we've ended up in monopoly and cartel. Now, why does this matter? It's very important. This matters because when you do this, this is wealth extracting. Remember that retail and banking and property, they don't create wealth, they just juggle it about the economy. So their job is to say, um, can we take your money or is it the local shop? Is it the local house builder or your chance to build your own house or is it us that takes the money? They don't create additional value, they just absorb it. Now, if they can absorb more and more of this value, um, then they get richer and richer and we get poorer and poorer. That's where the inequality came from. That's why we ended up where we are now. <coughs> and it doesn't work. Because if you look at what happens, it creates a hollowed out economy. Because when you follow this model, the key thing that you've got to do is what's called profit maximise. Now everyone thinks profit maximising is always good. No, it's not. Not in the British model. Because what it means is, take out as much as you can while putting in as little as you can in the shortest space of time possible. That's the British economic model. Now that means that what they want you to do is low skill, low pay work in high volume industries. Turn up, get paid very little, do something routine over and over again in a sector in which the owners can then take all their profits from the pockets of their customers. No work, nothing that involves skill, nothing that's creative. And if we reverse that, if we can change that, it can be completely different. Because if you look at why we're the second lowest paid economy, it's because we don't do create value in this economy. We don't make things, we don't do things. Our high value service sector is nothing like big enough. We rely on retail and low pay jobs and cleaning and a whole bunch of things which aren't productive. Now, should we be bothered? Oh yes, we should be very bothered. Let me ask a sort of rhetorical question. What would you say is a reasonable wage? A kind of decent salary that you'd say that someone could live comfortably on? You know, pay the bills, get to the end of the month, fine, and participate in the economy. You know, you're not going to have a tax law, you're not going to blow in your money on foreign sports cars, but you're not relying on benefits, you're not relying on tax credits. You can live a decent life. 25,000 to 35,000 pounds? Of everybody in full-time work in Scotland today, only one in five <coughs> earns between 25,000 and 35,000 pounds. Three out of five earn less than 25,000 pounds. Half earn less than £21,000, and if you get to the end of this year and you've earned £14,000, you're still better off than a third of our working population. <coughs> we have a chronic low pay economy. Now, what happens if it doesn't look like that? What happens if it isn't like that? Well, we did a, pop, a paper on our website, um, readfoundation.org, and what we did with this is we simply took the Scottish tax model. We ran it again. We didn't change the size of the economy. So we kept the economy notionally the same size, no change there. We didn't change any of the tax rates. We kept them absolutely as they were. All we did was we spread wages across the economy like they have the spread in a Nordic economy. So not all the big chunk of terrible low paid jobs from about the middle downwards, not the extremely high paid jobs at the top, and a higher employment rate. They've got many more people in work in these countries. <coughs> if you do that and you do nothing else and you run the tax model again, it will generate £4 billion of additional income. 
4 billion. And that's not including all the money you would then be saving by not having to pay tax credits and benefits. 4 billion pounds. It's probably worth 6, 7, 8 billion. People often say, hey, where does the money come from for the good society? That's where the money comes from, from a good society. We do not have a problem in this country of, too, of not enough tax. We do not have a problem in this country of too much public services. We have a problem in this country with not enough of our national wealth in the pockets of our working people. That is the fundamental problem which creates everything else that comes from there. If we had that £8 billion, £6, £7, £8 billion, pounds, we wouldn't be talking about deficit. It would not be a problem. We could fund all the public services we wanted without difficulty. We have a chronic low pay economy. So, can we fix it? Yeah, yeah, we can fix it. We can fix it remarkably fast if we are willing to try. Um, let me give a couple of examples. What we need to do <coughs> is have an industrial policy. An industrial policy says, up until now, for the last 40 years, we've been told that us as citizens are going to sit in the corner and accept whatever corporations want because the economy is their sphere. No, the economy is part of society. We live in a democratic society, so if we want to have a different economy, we have a democratic right to try. What we have to do is say that our industries would create wealth, local economies, are incredibly important. If we lose more local economies, more centralisation, you lose wealth from local communities and people get poorer and poorer. Local economies matter. Manufacturing matters. Making things matter. Retail doesn't matter. The more retail we have, the poorer we get. We have to wake up. All their profits come from our pockets. All of their profits come from our pockets and they export them out of the economy. Retail, the more retail that you have, eventually the more gets extracted out of your economy. Which is why Glasgow is the second shopping centre in the whole of Britain and it's the city with the highest levels of poverty. We've got to be, you cannot regenerate yourself by just letting multinational corporations come in and take your money. So we've got to work in local economies. We've got to do a whole series of things which enable local economies to grow. Because local retail doesn't create value either, but it keeps the money in the economy. Your local shopkeeper gets that money and they, you know, they go for a local plumber and a local electrician when they need to and they show up in their local economy. We've got to have local economies. We've got to have a national programme for creating industries that create good work. Now, um, there's not time to talk about this just now, but I'll give you a couple of quick examples. If we use an industrial policy, we can create a lot of very good jobs quickly. Britain is the only country in Europe which does not own its national grid. Our national grid is owned by two private companies. We've got no say over our national grid. If we were independent, we could take our national grid back. At the moment, the way we would develop our energy is we let private corporations buy cheap Chinese technology and put it on the land of millionaire landowners. They then capture all of our natural resources, our wind, and export all that to their uh, shareholders. We get 20% tax on the profits that they make. If we owned our own grid, we could straightforwardly say, no, it's our energy, it's our na nation, we will build those technologies here. We will build the technologies which will create the next generation of renewables here, the next generation of energy storage here. It won't cost any more, we have to do this anyway, we have to replace almost all of our energy generation over the next 20 years. So this is a straightforward question. Do we want the power to develop that next generation of energy in a way that makes us rich? Or do we want to have the lack of power which ensures that that next generation of energy will be developed in a way which makes corporations rich? Housing. We have a major problem in this country with housing. When, uh, 20, uh, 30 years ago, for every £100 that was the public spent on housing, £90 went on bricks and mortar and £10 went on housing benefit. Today, for every £100 that the public spends on housing benefit, 95, sorry, on housing, £95 goes on benefit, on housing benefit, and £5 goes on bricks and mortar. It's why we have a dreadful stock of high quality rental housing which pushes prices up bullies people into having to get mortgages that they can't afford or that they don't need. And if you look at what it's like in other countries, in Germany, young professionals don't want to own a house. It's a millstone round their neck. They can have such high quality, reasonably priced, public sector or private sector rental houses that they say, nah, why tie yourself down with a house? I can get a good quality house anytime I want with as long a tenure as I want and I can do whatever I want to it. Um, why would I want a mortgage? 
We need to create a new generation of house building. We can do this straightforwardly. Austerity is an anti-investment an anti investment ideology. We can borrow sensibly in a national company against future rents. Because one of the things they ever talk about in housing is it generates rents. We can build an entire new generation of housing um, in that borrowing, in that national company, which will control house prices, create high quality housing, and above all, will create lots and lots of high quality jobs immediately. Now, these are just two examples of ways in which we can use industrial policy to create tens and tens of thousands of jobs, which are high paid, high skilled jobs in this economy, if we are willing to take the power to do it. We don't have the powers to do it. We have no borrowing powers. We have no control over the grid. We have no powers over competition policy. We have no macroeconomic policy powers of any description whatsoever. We are limited in what we can do. Uh, if people tell you, oh, you could just do it just now, you can't. You can. Now, I'll stop there because I really do want to the, it's the questions. I want to answer questions. Um, just to say that this project started in the Jimmy Reid Foundation about a bit over a year ago, a year and a half ago. We were going to produce six papers just to see what could you do with independence. And we announced it. And this country is so alive just now. This country is buzzing just now. There are so many people in this country just now who want to see, don't let this campaign finish without having a chance to show what we could really do. And we were starting to get knocked down in offers. People were phoning us up, do you want a paper on this, do you want a report on that? We are now over 50 papers in this project. Now, these papers cover everything. They cover from housing through to um, how children can have a democratic say, all the way through to investment strategies, economic policy, education, everything, the full law. And these policy papers do show in a confident way how we can transform this country. Nothing in those 50 policy papers, nothing that we propose hasn't been tried somewhere else and been shown to work. Because that's what we did. We looked around the world and we said, who's done it better than us? And what can we learn from them? So, these 50 papers are there. Who can read 50 papers? I mean, dear God, I've got to pay me, but that's why my beard's great. great. <laughs> um, who can read 50 papers? So what we did was, we decided people need to understand and feel confident that there is a way we can change. <coughs> There's a real chance to change. So what we did was, we took those 50 papers, we set ourselves some very tight rules, we wrote them up in a short, easily readable book. No jargon, no bullet points, no references, no footnotes, no charts, no graphs, no italics, no... nothing. Complicated, just a simple story about how we transform things in a way that people can understand. And I just got it back from print today. So I've got one box here, if anyone wants, we're, just, we're selling it, we'd love to give them away, we haven't got any money. Um, so we're selling them for five. Um, I've got a box and people can give me a shout when we get back to the end. But what we're saying is, we have had one economic model, a me first economic model. It told us we were all going to win. We didn't. We've had 35 years of Me First politics, and we all came second. It's not good enough. We need to admit who we are. We need to admit what we can be. The best quote of this entire referendum campaign so far was one old guy who was interviewed by a TV programme the other night, and they were saying to him, if Scotland was a car, what kind of car would it be? And he gave an answer, I'm a political strategist, and you could put 30 political strategists in a room and they would never come up with a phrase as good as this if you gave them an hour. And they said to him, Scotland was a car, what kind of car would it be? In a blink of an eye, he said, a half-finished Lamborghini. <laughs> My God, seriously, if I could buy that ability, I'd hire them. A half-finished Lamborghini, as good as it can be, and we've no built it yet. That's Scotland. We have everything we need in this country. We have the resource. We have the people. We have the knowledge. We have the willpower. We have everything that we need to build this economy. 35 years of me first politics and we all came second. We need a politics that puts all of us first. We'll never get it from Westminster. We need to take that power back if we want to change anything. Thank you.